I have always had an interest in history. And I was never... I wasn't bad at it. I was good at academics as a child, but I was better at math and science. So I thought, well, maybe I should do that. And I went into college thinking that that is what I would do. I moved to Rhode Island and went into pre-engineering sort of track. And after about a semester decided I had no interest whatsoever in engineering. And that what I really loved was history and I wanted to be able to be more involved with what people were doing and what people had done and less inclined planes. So I, I moved to Washington DC to study uh, Russian because I wanted to study 20th century history and I wanted to be able to read things in Russian. So I ended up there and I had to take a, or well, I was in a course, I suppose, that was trying to prepare us for, kind of trying to prepare us for schmoozing. We learned a lot of how to shake hands with people and how to address cardinals and archbishops. But uh, we also learned to interact with various parts of the university, and one of these assignments was in the university archives. And we were each assigned a letter that had been written, I'm not sure if they were all by people associated with the university, but mine was. Mine was a past president of the university in the 1800s. And he wrote this letter, I think it was to one of his siblings, I don't even remember for sure. And we had to basically transcribe it, so I think we were helping the archivists figure out what these letters said. But it was also a project for us then to research the people and what they wrote, and I just had such a great experience at the archive. The archivist was so friendly and so helpful, um, and it was just such a neat way to engage with history. And so I didn't know right then that I wanted to become an archivist, but the seed was sort of planted in the back of my mind. I knew at least I wanted to research more in this way, that I really enjoyed hands-on primary document, playing with old stuff kind of research. And that kind of led me down this path to where I am now. I took a few years off after college to figure out what I was going to do. I worked at a museum. Uh, I worked at the Wells Fargo Museum in Minneapolis and decided that I didn't, that I really liked that, but I didn't really want to do museums. I wasn't as interested in the three-dimensional objects. I wanted the stories. I wanted the paper. And that led me to library school, which led me to three years in Milwaukee, doing uh, my master's in library science and my master's in history, because I was still doing this Russian history thing, which I still love. And that then led me out to South Dakota. And I was out in Deadwood, South Dakota, working at a historical society there as their archivist. And, but I've, I've always loved Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota, I grew up in the western suburbs and I wanted the chance to come back. So this opportunity came up to come back to the Hennepin County Library, to the Central Library downtown and be their archivist and it was just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. I had interned there a number of years ago as uh, during that period where I was working for Wells Fargo and trying to figure out what I wanted to do and I had interned in the archive and it had been a really good experience and I knew that I'd get the chance to work with some of the same people and I was just so excited when they gave me the chance to come back so I'm happy to be back in Minnesota doing what I love doing and learning more Minneapolis history because I've never really studied Minneapolis history. I've lived it and I know it through learning it along the way and being here but it's fun to really study it. had a, an interest in history from early and I expect in Rhode Island and in Washington DC you were kind of stewed in history. Uh, but what are the roots of that interest? How did it, how can you say anything about its kind of its earliest manifestations or your, you know, the, the earliest kinds of questions that you asked? That's a good question. 
and I'm not sure I have a great answer. I I was always kind of a curious kid, but not in the sense of going out and trying things. I've never liked to experiment exactly. I like to observe and to read about it or listen to someone talk about it. I don't want to try it exactly. Um, although I do more now than I used to, but as a little kid it was I wanted someone to tell me what had been and what was the best way to do things. And so I just, I like the stories. I liked reading as a little kid and the books I liked were always, or oftentimes anyway, sort of historical fiction kind of books. I loved Betsy Tacey books and I loved Anne of Green Gables books and I loved these books that were people kind of like me. I mean, they were young girls, but they were in different situations. Um, and Betsy Tacey especially because they were in Minnesota and I was in Minnesota and it was such a different Minnesota than my Minnesota. Um, so that I just always really liked and I like kind of analyzing why people are doing what they're doing or why they did what they did. Um, and that's just so much of history. So I had the chance to be in an international baccalaureate program in high school. I went to Cooper High School in New Hope. And that was just a great experience because that was how they taught history. It was a lot of causes and effects and analyzing what the motivations were and what was going on and how people were telling their stories. And even there with a lot of primary documentation. And I, that fascinates me. I like reading all of these things and sort of putting them together and figuring out what was driving people and why they made the decisions they made. Because I, I believe that most of the time people make decisions because it makes sense to them to do it. And sometimes I look at the actions that people have taken in the past and they don't make sense to me. I think, well, that was a bad decision. But I think if we learn more about why they made that decision, I might still think it's a bad decision, but I understand why they did it. And that to me is fascinating. Now, the, the turn, however brief, to Russian history, in a way it perplexes me because it's a, it's a detour. I mean, it's got to be a detour around, you know, through a language. And also, I mean, you're living in the middle of, you know, you're living in two places where uh, the archives are rich and deep. If you really want to know about Roger Williams, <laughs> or it's all there, and, and you're living in the middle of this incredible military thing, which is its own sort of, 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 of story going back a long time. Um, what drew you to Russian stuff? The Cold War. I was always fascinated by, and still am, the Cold War, and especially the cultural components. American culture, popular culture, Soviet popular culture, um, popular culture in nations that were allied or in the sphere one way or another of either superpower. And so how this Cold War dynamic influenced the lives of average people. And I had learned enough through living here to kind and studying American history to kind of know a little bit what was going on with the Americans and just even through popular culture we sort of get a lot of that a lot of like Russian bad guys in movies but I didn't know at all what it looked like on the Russian side and in the time I was going to college which was like the mid 2000s late 2000s it was still new enough. You hadn't been able to get into Soviet archives very long. There was still this just outpouring of new information and figuring out new things. And it was easier in some ways to study Russia than it had been in the past. And I was just fascinated by it. And I still am. I wanted, I'd done enough research and projects using like declassified FBI documents or declassified CIA documents that are talking about Russia, but I wanted to read about Russians talking about Russia uh, or people living in a Russian context or a Soviet context. Um, and so 
yeah, it was kind of a detour, but it's one that I still really, really am fascinated by. Well, for my next puzzle about your story, I have to, you have to clarify for me the, the, the relationships and differences between archivists and archival historians. Uh, because kind of my next question is, so our heroine is heading towards, you know, at just the right point in time to become, to actually know something about the Russian side of the Cold War. You're headed towards linguistic competence, you're headed towards, you know, study trips to Moscow to sit around, you know, in, in, in those archives and, 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 and get the story. I mean, your life is mapped out for you. So what, what's with this archival stuff? It feels like, you know, you go from eating the food to handing it out. <laughs> Yeah, in some ways that's true. Well, so one of the things that I never liked, although I like it a lot more now, but when I was little I hated writing. Uh, and that lasted for quite a while. I'm, I'm a pretty good writer, but I didn't like it as a child and even through high school and even into college. And so writing's a huge part of being a historian. If you're going to be a historian, you have to write a lot. And I've done it and I like it now, but uh, but I was never that interested in that. I wanted to find neat stuff and help people with neat stuff. And as an archivist, that's one of the things that I get to do. So I really like that. Um, and I can write up short things, but I don't have to write like a 500 page book on anything. Other people can do that. I can just find neat things for them to look at. Um, and part of it was timing. I, when I, I graduated from college in 2009 and that was not the greatest time to be studying Russia because Russia at that point was kind of boring. It sounds weird now because Russia's in the news again now as what's going on with Russia, nobody's quite sure. But at that point, I remember being at a career fair uh, at school when I was graduating and there were people there from all over, especially a lot of government people because I was in DC. So I was talking to this guy from the CIA and he was asking me, how good's your Russian? Like, if we plop you in Moscow, are you going to be okay? I said, yeah, I'll be fine. I, I just studied in Moscow, so I just gotten back from Moscow. And, and he said, well, I mean, you can apply. But basically the gist of it was, we've got a whole bunch of Cold War Kremlinologists that haven't retired yet. And we don't really need people that know anything about Russia. Because this is when the whole reset button with Russia thing had just happened and we were on these really great terms with Russia. Uh, we thought we were going to be on these really great terms with Russia and so really nobody, nobody cared about Russia right then. Um, but a few years later things might have been a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. So how much I mean, you've got these two things, finding stuff out and helping other people find stuff out. Um, do you get to follow your own nose in the archive you live in right now? Absolutely. And that's one of the really fun things uh, that archivists get to do. We we get to see collections oftentimes before anybody else does apart from the creator or the person that put them together. So when new donations come into an archive, we're the ones that get to look through them and figure out what kind of order is here and make sure that they're usable for researchers. So if there isn't an order to sort of decipher the order and to make it an order that other people can understand. And in the, in doing that you get to know a collection really well and you get to find just neat things or things that sort of make you scratch your head a little bit um, which is always kind of fun and you get to interact with the researchers that are studying such a multitude of different things that that I probably wouldn't personally study or I'd never get around to it but with all of these different researchers and their interests they will point out interesting things that they come across. You know, I just found this story that's talking about this thing that I never knew happened. Um, 
and and those those are really fun to share with other people or to put on social media. A lot of them make really neat, entertaining stories. So how much is, of what you're doing is kind of publicity for the archive or kind of outreach for the archive? And, and how much is it, is it just this, this sort of helping scholars processing material as it comes in? How does that divide up? It's a little bit of everything. Uh, and it, I mean, it depends on the institution and depends on what needs to be done. So if we have a big backlog of a lot of big collections that are coming in, then more of my time is going to be processing them so that researchers can use them. But we, uh, at the library, we have an active Tumblr that's mainly special collections. So we put up fun things uh, a couple times a week or so on there. Sometimes it's things we come across, sometimes it's events and things that are going on in our department or across the library, um, but that's a neat outlet for a lot of those fun things that we come across. Um, but, but a lot of time is, is processing collections and, or caring for collections and making sure that people can access them and people know about them. I spoke yesterday to someone who uh, has the somewhat thankless job of um, handling the papers of a guy who was not universally hated but pretty close to and for pretty decent reason and she came in very excited and, and f with a uh, a painting of some quality of a Madonna which had shown up in this guy's stuff. Uh, he's never expressed an interest in anything in that direction uh, so what do I... <laughs> What does this mean? And why in the middle of <laughs> this correspondence, which is to a considerable extent uh, not uh, edifying, <laughs> does one find a Madonna? <laughs> so I mean, just as an example of, of the kind of surprise you're, you're talking about. Um, so the person I know who spends the most time of in, in, in archives and makes her life of that is refers to herself as an archive rat. Are, 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 have you reached rat status? I mean, do you do rat, ratty sort of stuff? Or I don't there... know. Well, what exactly does that mean? Do we know of archive rat? Well, I, I think I think it has to do with the amount of time and the amount of discomfort one is willing to tolerate. She talks about the tear gas seeping in through the vents and a great deal of dust and no order at all and, and mold <laughs> and low light before there were digital cameras to cop. I mean, she, she talks about, you know, the sort of suffering that... You you know, low-level, constant <laughs> suffering for months at a time. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I have been very lucky, and I am very lucky. I work in a great location, and we... I don't have to deal with a lot of that kind of icky stuff. I mean, every collection has some things that you come across it every once in a while that you think, what is this? And this maybe shouldn't be here. Or why is this dusty? Or what is on this? Um, but, but we're a really, really wonderful facility. Um, I'm, I'm in the Central Library, which is a pretty new building. And our parts of it are really nice. And we're, we're not even in the basement, which is fantastic. Archives, I think, have this reputation of being like these dark basements. And some of them really are. Yeah. Um, and that made sense, sort of, when people were trying to be really secure and really cool and the only place that they thought that could be was in a basement. Um, but it's not the case anymore. We're up on the fourth floor of the library and we've got big windows and it's really, it's really nice. So I am, I've been very lucky. So it's not a rat So I, Yeah, I don't, I don't have to be a rat. Nothing at all. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a very, it's a very good deal. <laughs> Sometimes you get new collections that come in that are a little dusty or that have some, but we take care of that stuff. So. Well, how much, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm re recalling my friend's accounts. I mean, it's like, 
all of the building records for literally 400 years are piled someplace in this room, but nobody has labeled them uh, at, or, or sorted the ones that are important from the others. How, how much processing do you do when one of these things comes in? You get, you know, I mean, I've seen, I've seen the boxes of even moderately famous people's papers. I mean, they go to the ceiling and fill a room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How much, what do you do? How much do you do? Oh, that's going to get the classic library archivist answer of it depends. Yeah. Um, actually, it's a really contentious, or maybe contentious is the wrong word, but it's a really discussed dilemma in archives right now because you're right it's a lot of stuff and if you were gonna go through and like, remove paper clips or staples from everything it would take a lifetime for some of these collections and then you how many collections would acquire while you were doing that uh so, so there was a paper written about 10 years ago uh, by archivists connected with the university, or excuse me, with the Minnesota Historical Society, where they called for something that they called more product, less process. So MPLP, which basically means don't do as much of this, like, little processing stuff. Do less of it and make it accessible to people. So... Sometimes if a collection comes in and the people that had it had it really well organized and it makes sense and if you're looking for information on whatever kind of topic you're going to be able to find it, then I don't have to do very much. Um, it maybe is okay to just be like that. But if it's the collection that comes in where, where I can't figure out what the organizational system was or there isn't one seemingly, then it's going to take more work because that's the kind of collection that isn't going to be very useful to a researcher if they can't, if they or I have no idea really what's in it. So those take more time and more effort. And sometimes, sometimes something that seems like a bunch of boxes will get weeded down into not as many because it could be that they have you know, all of their bank statements from 1985 in that box or like all of the receipts that they've acquired since the 70s. And that's probably stuff that we're not going to keep. Um, so, so some of those things or, you know, 500 copies of a mailing that went out and really we just need one of those. Uh, so some of that will weed itself down uh, fairly easily. Like if it's a big Ch chunk of copies of those things. Those are kind of fun boxes because you open them up and you can just easily see, okay, it's 500 of this lime green brochure. We don't need that many of them. And we can shorten this up and make it more useful and we have room for other collections too. Um, but yeah, you never quite know until you open that box what's really going to be in there. Can you, I mean, don't want to put a pitch on the spot, but can you, can you, Say anything about the the you know the the, mo the five most fun boxes you've had. I mean the the times when you opened the box mm -hmm. and wow. <laughs> you know I I don't have any of these great box opening stories yet. So many people do, and I haven't. I've heard some really great ones like people open them and they find cannonballs or they find like dead animals and I, I I mean I'm okay with not having that experience that second one but I haven't really had any of these yet um I've hmm I don't know I've I've had a couple of those boxes where I open them up and it's basically all receipts which are not exactly fun but they kind of make me giggle um because I could see I could see easily ending up with a box that's just full of receipts. Like it's just if you haven't moved in years and this box is just here and it's just full of receipts, you don't really know that anymore. Um, so those are kind of fun, not because of what's in them, but because you can kind of picture what, how this could happen and probably this, the person who had this box didn't really want this box of receipts either. Um, so that's kind of fun. But I found I found some neat scrapbooks. Scrapbooks are always kind of fun. Um, 
oftentimes because people think that they're saving the material and they are I mean they made a scrapbook but a lot of times the material is like really acidic newspaper and it's the kind of on really acidic scrapbook paper and it's the sort of stuff that's not gonna last very well and so they can be really fun to open them up and see the creativity and how someone compiled this thing and sometimes you get neat little things in them. I had a scrapbook the other day that had like a yellow crepe paper bow that was taped into it and I, I don't know why. It wasn't by anything that would make that make sense. Or what I think was probably someone's corsage from a dance was in there too. Just kind of fun stuff. Um, I've had family bibles with those sorts of things in them too. Like the kind of things that Sir that clearly someone was pressing this between the pages of the Bible and forgot about it and it was still there. Like four-leaf clovers, those sorts of things. Um, but I haven't had anything truly, truly weird yet when I've opened a box. So mm -hmm. it's probably coming, but I don't know what it'll be. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, so is this, has this experience with other people's scrapbooks and boxes and so forth influenced how you put together your own record uh, for whoever comes after you and wants to know who you were? In some ways it does, or at least it should. Um, I've never been a scrapbooker, so I don't have I don't have that bug. I'm more in awe of the people that do it than anything, because to me it just seems really time consuming. Uh, but but I am definitely never going to put photographs in one of those photo albums with the page, the plastic that you pull up and it's sort of sticky underneath and you put the pictures in and you close the plastic down because those things are awful. Don't use those things. Um, hard to get the pictures out. But to some extent it has. I am much more aware of writing names on the back of photographs. Um, as we get so many photographs here or at previous places that I've worked where y you don't know who it is or you don't know what's going on and I actually a couple of years ago when I first started encountering so many pictures without that useful metadata without the names or the dates I found two shoe boxes full of photographs in my grandma's house and they were just all jumbled up photographs, like little tiny black and white ones from the 20s mixed with you know, printouts from a computer five years ago. And, and so I took the shoe boxes and a pencil or a pen for the ones I couldn't write in pencil and sat my grandma down and made her tell me for a couple of hours who was in these pictures. And she clearly had no interest in this whatsoever. Um, but I, so we made it through about maybe a quarter to half of them, and I know that we're never going to know who's in the rest of those photographs. Um, but but that was clearly something I cared about more than more than she did. So we did it for a while, and then 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 I figured that the rest of them would be up to me if I really wanted to try and figure it out. But so I I am writing on physical pictures and writing in the notes field of digital pictures because I think that's a big problem to come. Nobody knows who's in anything digital or it's not labeled in any way in attached to the actual file for a lot of our digital things but that'll be a fun bridge to cross when we get there. Well, is there some hope that if there's any labeled image, you can you can label all the rest. I mean, is the technology getting there? Probably. I mean, I haven't used any of these services, but I know they're out there. Like even Google and Facebook can identify people in photographs now. Um, so so maybe we're getting there. Maybe it won't be as big of a problem. That would I don't know. I haven't tried them. I don't know how well they work, mm -hmm. but. I had a friend who did a writing retreat at Amy Clampett's house in, in, New, in New England, in the in place where the Hudson River School painted. And Amy Clampett was an important enough poet and that, uh, you know, the, the, the atmosphere was big. And they hadn't done a lot of work with the material, so she kept kind of 
pulling a book out of the sh out of off the shelf and opening it, and there was a postcard or a letter or a set of notes or something. <laughs> uh, but it must be a difficult thing when you're working with the papers of someone accomplished like that. Uh, because a lot of your rules about what to throw out get twisted. <laughs> you know, that box, if we had Shakespeare's box <laughs> of, you know, expenditures, or there's a famous picture of, you know, Michelangelo's shopping list, which he sent off with his guy who couldn't read very well, so he had to draw a picture of the pieces of bread and the sides of meat that he wanted. Of course, you know, I, my guess is you couldn't buy it for a million dollars today. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, a, and it's, 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 it's an important document of what a great artist does in a very casual mode. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you run into that problem of, of dealing with people too talented to kind of, uh, to kind of uh, write off, even when they do something silly, yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question what belongs in any given repository and how do you navigate that? Because it always makes me think of one of the kind of found, or founding is the wrong word, fundamental, I suppose, ideas of librarianship, that there's a book for every reader and a reader for every book. So probably there's some researcher that could really make use of someone's gas station receipts from 1992. But there's also the problem of, is my repository the place where we should keep someone's gas station receipts from 1992? Uh, or if someone's trying to do that research, are they ever going to come look for us? So it's, yeah, it's definitely a question and definitely becomes a more complicated one when you're dealing with somebody that's really well known. Um, but I think it's kind of a problem with any collection or any individual. I was working on the the Socialist Party of Milwaukee's archives when I was at school and Milwaukee has a really strong socialist legacy. They had socialist mayors, uh, socialist members of Congress from the Milwaukee area, so it was socialism's heyday in the U.S. in a lot of ways was in Milwaukee. It was sort of the best example of successful socialism in the U.S. So we had papers from the Socialist Party and in its more recent era, so from about the 70s onward, kind of after the last of the Socialist Mayors of Milwaukee. And just because socialism was so important to Milwaukee and we were a Milwaukee repository, this collection was really important. But it wasn't the order was really hard to figure out and sometimes there wasn't one and so we're running into that problem a lot of this is important because it's from the socialist party but we can't figure out what it is or what it goes with and is anybody ever going to be able to figure it out and with some of the little like scraps of paper or little post-it sort of things um so yeah you run into that question a lot and i don't think in any two archivists are probably going to have different answers over a wide collection but a lot just depends on who are we really serving? Who are our patrons? What's the mission of our organization? So at the library, we have a really large Minneapolis collection that covers Hennepin County and Minneapolis especially. And if it's connected to Minneapolis and to Hennepin County, that's kind of the, for that collection, the fundamental question. And then you just kind of go from there and try and figure it out. Um, there used to be, back in the early days of archives, it was kind of the idea that anything old was valuable. Like anything that survived this long must be important. And in some ways that's still kind of true, but we just make so much more stuff now with, with, with computers and even printing presses, right? We've got way more paper stuff than they used to have. So you can't necessarily just save something because it's old. Unless it'll help your institution if it's old. Like when I was out in 
South Dakota, we were a museum. So we also wanted things that could be put on display. So we would save receipts and things from local companies because you could put them in a display and they were interesting. It was a dry cleaner that used to be on Main Street in Deadwood or something like that, uh, which in that sense, then yeah, save it. You remind me, we haven't actually touched that Deadwood experience, <laughs> which any any more uh, kind of flashy National Enquirer kind of interview would have started with. A museum in Deadwood. So tell tell me about that. How how was that part of your of your uh, life? That was a really neat adventure. Um, I really enjoyed it. I was only actually out there about six months. But we were a, a nonprofit that ran three museums and a archive in the city of Deadwood. So one of our museums was the oldest museum in the Black Hills, doing Black Hills history. Then we had a house museum and we had a, uh, excuse me, museum about this annual celebration in Deadwood called the Days of 76 that sort of celebrated the early gold mining pioneers of Deadwood. So a lot of stagecoaches and horses and they have an annual rodeo and a big parade. <coughs> Excuse me. And then my archive, or the archive, which our main collection was the papers of a gold mine that had been next door in Leeds, South Dakota. And it was the oldest, largest gold mine in the Western Hemisphere. It had operated for 126 years and had closed in the early 2000s. So we had their institutional records all about gold mining in South Dakota, which was something I knew next to nothing about. I had worked for Wells Fargo in their history museum, so I knew California Gold Rush because that was their founding. I knew California Gold Rush somewhat, but I didn't really know Black Hills Gold Rush at all, um, or anything about underground mining. Uh, and that was that was really kind of a neat adventure because the gold mines closed now, but it's actually a science lab. They do physics experiments on neutrinos and trying to find out the properties of neutrinos. And that far underground, they're on I think the 4800 level of the mine. They can do experiments that without the interference of the sun's radiation, which was kind of neat. But it was, it was a fun experience. I'd never lived in Western South Dakota, hadn't been there since I was 12 years old and drove out to Mount Rushmore. So it was, it was fun. Yeah. I remember touring the uh, we're just driving around the mining operation up above Mackey, Idaho, which was not as not a big successful one. It, it, apparently, it's a story of we kept drilling holes and we found enough that we made it made sense to drill more oh. holes and bring a whole lot of people to live in enormously uncomfortable places, <laughs> clinging to the mountain. Mm -hmm. But we never actually got very much out of it all. It's, a, it's, a, it's sort of the story that you get from the ruins. I mean, I'm sure there's a more complicated story in some archive that I did visit. But I guess the question is, you know, when you when you, you you touch this material and you think about, I mean, what ended up happening to your feeling about the operation and your, your kind of, I mean, how did that kind of get integrated into your picture of the world? <laughs> or did it? I mean, it doesn't have to, but... I think it did. It was the first time I'm from I'm from Minneapolis suburbs. I went to school in Providence and in DC and in Milwaukee. So I'm from cities. And this is the first time that I had ever lived in a rural area. And that in and of itself was a really neat experience. It was a different experience. It was small town life, small tourist town, which is unique in and of itself because Deadwood has definitely got a strong tourism industry. But that was, that was a really neat experience. Um, and that's changed the way I see the world a little bit. Um, the, so some of the assumptions 
-hmm. or like the axioms that we ground ourselves in here are different than the assumptions or the axioms that people in Deadwood are grounded in and that's just kind of neat to experience a different culture. I mean it's the same culture in a lot of ways but it's not as different as like going to Moscow but it's different and so that was that was fun and it was neat to learn more about these mines. I've I have an interest in company towns and in employer-employee relationships um, and actually that's kind of what I wrote my graduate thesis on so that part of it was kind of fun too to look at this town of Leeds, South Dakota that had been basically in existence because of the home state gold mine and how do the people interact with the mine and what happens to the town once the mine's gone and that is still, in a lot of ways, I think a big loss in that town. This was a huge employer, and it was also a huge influence on everything. On The founder of the mine's wife founded the library, and it's named after her. And they founded a big opera house that's still there. And so how, what, what happens then to this town that's, you know, 3,000 people, but it's in, like, the highest elevation of the Black Hills and kind of like you were saying, like not somewhere you'd really build a town unless there was a gold mine there. <laughs> so what do you what do you do now? Um, and, and the lab's really cool, but the lab's not going to employ as many people as the mine did. So I don't know, it'll be interesting to see. I think the town's got a lot going for it, but it's still a decade and a half, almost two decades after the mine closed. I think it's still kind of in a time of transition. And where do you go from? from there. Yeah. yeah. And that's a very Minnesota topic too. I mean you'll find Absolutely. The, I mean and if you broaden it to industry towns, mm -hmm. I just talked to the librarian for a major window making thing mm -hmm. a year or so ago up north and there's a an employer who dominates the town and indeed the the, the wife of the guy who ran the window and mm -hmm. thing built, built the library, yeah. you know. Uh, so it's the same. It's the same story. Absolutely, yeah. So I, mean, I know this is impossible, but it, or, or rather, it's kind of like the question you get asked at your graduate orals. But I still want to ask. I mean, one thing you are is an historian, and you kind of remain an historian, and. Can you say a little more about what your interests are as an historian? Leave aside being an archivist, leave aside, you know, who's employing you and feeding you, and just, you know, uh, what, what, you've got a really long life, likely, ahead, and, and really a lot of time, and, the, and a, kind of an ideal seat to poke around. What kind of questions do you follow? Do you want to follow as a, as a historian? I am always drawn to cultural history, but not necessarily quote unquote high culture, but kind of daily life of people in a place during a time. And I've gotten to poke around with that in different contexts in South Dakota, kind of what I was just talking about, but even in Russia and in Milwaukee, I was writing for the Encyclopedia of Milwaukee. So I was doing encyclopedia entries on different religious groups or municipalities or businesses and getting to learn a little more about that daily life in a place or at a company. And I still really like that. So that's one of the things that most interests me now in learning more about Minnesota history and Minneapolis Hennepin County history is the different different groups of people different individuals what their daily life was like where they shopped where they got their news what they read what they uh, were excited about what were the big headlines in the newspaper because a lot of times the things that were really big news at the time we don't necessarily remember in retrospect because they weren't necessarily the things that when you can look back at it through the lens of history seem the most important um, and sometimes the things that we think are really important when we look through history 
people at the time didn't necessarily care that much either. They were more interested in something local that had happened. I remember I was working or helping with an archive that was trying to highlight some of their school newspapers and they had this big school newspaper collection. So they were looking for newspapers that mentioned big points in American history and they thought they'd put up some of these you know, blow up the front pages. And what they found was that the school newspaper wasn't really even covering like the Great Depression or a lot of things in World War II. It wasn't, it wasn't really big, exciting news. It was sort of just ongoing. They were more interested in the school dance or the football team or, you know, what was going on at the school. And, and that's the kind of stuff that I think is really fun to uncover because we don't collectively remember it as well in a lot of instances or or people that lived through it remember it but the next generation has never heard of it um because it's not exactly like the where were you when kennedy got shot sort of thing it's more the you know where were you when the northwestern national bank building burned down at thanksgiving and people my age might not even know that happened um so it's kind of fun to uncover some of those things Well, some of the peop the best people doing that, in my experience, are, are especially some young adult authors who do their homework, and they they can bring things back to life. Uh, John Peck is my current hero, but there are a bunch more like it. Um, so, but that that raises an archive question. I mean, you've got. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 there's an easy thing. What's the archive about? Well, there's this crap, this incredible number of historians who have various questions and local people who have particular sort of family questions, and they'll keep the archives busy forever with whatever enterprise they're doing. Essentially, you don't have to worry about demand because uh, we've, you know, that'll be taken care of by other institutions, but doesn't necessarily get taken care of by other institutions. And the other thing is that there are, a lot, there are lots of possible things, things that people would really like to know if they knew that they were things they didn't know, <laughs> you know. It, and it's to, and you, get, you sometimes get very close to the end of life before you realize what you really wanted to know about your father. I mean, I'm, I, you know, my father told me about horses over and over again in passing and I it's taken me this long to realize I want to know about workhorses because that was the most important thing in the world mm -hmm. and it's un, it's invisible to us now that relationship with any animal is just not there so how do you do the kind of outreach that ensures that you keep getting a diverse <laughs> set of people coming to ask you questions. It's challenging. Um, and I think, I think part of outreach is just being inquisitive and wanting yourself, wanting to know some of those different things. And that'll bring you in touch with different groups of people and different questions and different things people are studying. Um, I mean, kind of like you were alluding to, one of the things you discover as you study history is how much you don't know and how many questions you've never thought to ask. Um, at least that's what I discover. And I think, I think as the public library, we're in a good position to reach out to people. People know about the library. They might not know about special collections, so we're still working on that, but we have that connection to to the public more broadly, I think a little bit less less frighteningly perhaps than like a university archive, which have great resources, but I think might not seem as accessible to many people, even if they are. And the public library, I think is something that a lot of people have had experience with and that a lot of people have hopefully had good experience with. And so we, we have a nice connection there. And then the challenge is to, to learn more ourselves and to learn what we don't know about and to find people that do know about those things and collections that can speak to different topics and different events and different aspects of local history. 
So I think we're doing a good job of that and it's something that, but it's a perpetual challenge to continue to do that and to continue to learn um, about things that we think we know pretty well, right? To continue to learn about where we're from and, uh, and what the experience is really like here for so many different people having so many different experiences right here, which is really kind of cool. I'm curious about your, your thoughts about Wikipedia. I mean, Wikipedia has been, for me, kind of the opening of the world. I mean, it is an encyclopedia with no bounds, mm -hmm. which means that I can be confident for anything I just hear about, that I'll find a way of getting at it. And I've very, very seldom been disappointed. It's going to be the first stop on the road to your archive for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So how, how, do you, how do you think about that? I mean, it's, it's the newest and biggest thing kind of around. How do you think about it as an archivist? I like it. I, Wikipedia obviously has its, its problems. It's not a great site to, uh, or a source to cite in a paper or something like that because anybody can change it. So who knows if it even still says that or who knows where this person got their information. So it's better to track back a little bit um, to find really the source. But but I think it's a great resource for what you're saying, entry level to information. I think the internet more broadly is fantastic for that. And that's a direction that a lot of archives are going is getting our material digitized, getting it up so that people can use it remotely, so they can find it remotely and trying to to solve part of that problem of how do they even know we have any of this stuff. Well, hopefully we can, and we are digitizing a lot and getting a lot out online, so hopefully people Googling things will come across our material and think, oh great, I can access this, this is fantastic. Um, and I, th I think it's a great resource. I think digitized newspapers are a great resource too for the same reason, uh, that it's an easy way to find historic information and to sort of go from there. They're, they're great launching pads into our collections because sometimes sometimes the bigger manuscript collections aren't the easiest place to start. To try and read through 20 years of somebody's correspondence might be really challenging if you don't know exactly what date or time you're looking for. But if you can sort of come at it through Wikipedia or come at it through a newspaper or come at it through some other easier indexed or online source it's just it's kind of a weight off of your shoulders in some ways it can make the work a little easier at least make some framework around it that you kind of know what you're doing rather I and mean, it's fun to just kind of dive into a collection but it can be really scary mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. so there was this I always want to kind of go back to pieces of the story. There was this Cold War Russia interest. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know if you know it. We're in the we're in the, we're in the center of Little Russia, or at least little little Slavic mm -hmm. land, about right here. Mm -hmm. uh, so is is that has that interest endured for you? Have you kept your Russian up? My Russian is probably really awful right now. Um, the interest endures, and I do try to keep it up somewhat. I used to read more Russian papers and do those sorts of things, but lately I haven't done much. I started learning, speaking of where we're located, I started learning Polish a year or so ago. Um, well, I guess two years ago, I took a year of Polish, which was kind of fun. Um, uh, a lot of the same Slavic language roots as Russian, but different enough that it was a challenge and, and a good experience. And that's one of my closest connections to Northeast, actually, or my most fond memories of Northeast is for the last few years I've been coming up to, uh, to Holy Cross to go to their Midnight Mass at Christmas in Polish and in English, which has been kind of fun because the first couple years I went was before I started studying any Polish 
so I could pick up a little bit through words that sounded like Russian, but that was about as far as I got. And then uh, when I was actually taking Polish was, was kind of fun to really, still it was just words because I only had a year, but to pick out really more of what was being said was a neat experience. Um, and so it's something I, I like to keep up, but right now it's, it's pretty rusty. Um, but I have a whole bunch of Russian language books at home that a friend of mine bought actually from the library bookstore a number of years ago and then decided she didn't want. So I have a stack full of like everything from memoirs of a geisha to biographies of Stalin in Russian that at some point I hope to read. <laughs> we'll see. Well, you'll find, I mean, there, the, the Russian connections are, are so interesting, I mean, and the, the Slavic connections more generally. I mean, there's a pierogi factory, you know, three, you know, four blocks oh, really? that way with, you know, they've been doing these things for years, and it's this collection of, of elderly uh, immigrants, usually, who... who do this and do do pierogies right, uh, but at the same time, I mean, I when my son, kids were going to school, some of the people in the you know some of the pe parents were probably the last serious readers of Stalin's essays. <laughs> so you get bold, all sorts of all sorts of stuff. Well, do you think that uh, you might you might evolve into the kind of Library liaison to the to to the to the to the you know Slavic immigrant communities to the Northeast outpost. Uh. I don't know. I think the library actually already has a number of people that that deal in Slavic language literature for sure, and I would assume outreach too. Although I don't know about that, but I know I've met at least a couple of people, other people who speak Russian and speak it better than I do since I started at the library, which is kind of kind of fun so so how big a crew is it the archives the archives we're pretty well we're pretty small in a way but we're good size for an archive um we have our director we have our special collections librarian uh and then we have uh, a digitization specialist we have me and we have a few other part-time project employees that help with some of our big projects. And we have a wonderful crew of volunteers, which is fantastic. That's, uh, all these things I don't know about. Uh, and then, then how, are you, how are you related to the rest of the library? We are part of the library. So we're, uh, we're part of collections and technical services. Uh, because we deal in a lot of collections, but we're located right on the fourth floor of the central library So if you just take the stairs of the elevator all the way up, you'll see us. We're under a big pretty uh, Wooden archway right there in the library <laughs>